Oh, the mark of the beast is a microchip. Oh, the mark of the beast is the vaccine. Oh, the mark of the beast is X, Y, Z. When we go to the book of Revelation, all of a sudden we throw everything out the window and we just impose our own modern ideas and we just make it say whatever we want it to say. The newspaper does not interpret scripture. We can't take a shortcut. We have to do the work. We can't jump from A to Z. Where do we see in the Bible a mark on the forehead? Next question, why is the mark 666? The clothing in the skins of beasts, again, that's also a mercy and a judgment. It's a mercy because it covers their sh the shame of their nakedness, but it's also a judgment because it's manifesting the fact that they have now become bestial. Everything God does is, is, is both mercy and judgment. This is why, like, when Jesus calls the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, it's not just a, like a catchy insult. He's saying you're, you're sons of the serpent. You think you're part of the righteous line. Actually, you're part of the line of the serpent. Anyone who imitates Satan becomes a child of Satan. Anyone who imitates God becomes a child of God. And people will jump to a million things to try to find what 666 means. But it's actually very simple. Why is six a number of man? Think about it. Where is the dictionary that defines what these things mean? That sounds a lot like... Mm -hmm. What do you think of that statement when people say that? That is the most important statement that's ever been said about the Bible. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Well, let's move on then. Um, you said you everything touches everything theologically. Yes. That sounds a lot like scripture interprets scripture. Mm -hmm. Is that, What do you think of that statement when people say that? That is the most important statement that's ever been sa said about the Bible that we need to recover. We have given up on... We, we don't really, like, we say scripture interprets scripture, but we don't really believe it because we will uh, go to uh, historical context first. We will go to linguistic studies first. We will go to uh, critical analysis first. Mm. We will go to all of these things outside the Bible first to help us interpret the Bible. And we prioritize those tools because we, we don't really believe that scripture actually interprets scripture. Because we're trying to interpret, and this is what I talked about in episode four of, the, of my podcast, is like we are trying to approach scripture with the reason of man yeah, and with like a rationalistic approach. Right. And so, uh, and so we, uh, we, by doing so, we blind ourselves to the layers, like, like you just said, we blind ourselves to the layers of meaning that are in the scriptures uh, that we can perceive spiritually in the spirit. Um, such as shadows in the Old Testament that point to Christ, for example. That's a very easy example that most people can relate to is, um, you know, Abraham offering Isaac. Obviously, that's a picture of, uh, of God and his sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, for yeah. our sake. Okay, or like the ram replacing Isaac. That's, uh, you know, Christ replacing what we should have uh, under, under, undergone, which was the, 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 the knife of death, like the, you know, mm -hmm. and the fire. So, you know, that's one example. Uh, or you have, you know, Isaiah 53, which is talking about the suffering servant, which, you know, is obviously it's, it's talking about what Israel is going through at the time, but that's not ultimately really fundamentally what it's talking about. That's just a, that's just a, a picture of the true suffering servant, Christ. Okay, so we know that. And we, we, get, those, we get these things from the New Testament also. So th those are examples people usually recognize stuff like that. But that's, that's the way to actually interpret the scripture, not primarily. Okay, I'll give you some examples. Like, like when people say, when people say uh, oh, you know, when Jesus says, like, it's easier to, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And then they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, in, in, in the first century, there was, like, there was a gate, right? And it was, like, very narrow. And uh, if, if you wanted to pass through that gate, you had to unload your camel of everything. And the camel had to get down on its hands and knees and it had to crawl through that space. It could barely fit. Yeah, you could sermonize with the illustration of the camel because the rich have to unload their wealth and give it to the poor before. But, but there's no evidence of that. That's just some, something that someone, you know, speculated about as a way of explaining it. As far as I know, that's not really what that means. Um, but, that, but that's just an example of how we jump to historical context to explain something uh, instead of asking the question, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible mean by this? What does Jesus mean by what's, what's Where do we see references to camels? Or uh, where do we see uh, references to his greater topic about the rich and how is it that they're able to enter the kingdom? Now, I, I just, I, I want to be actually slow to go through these, these examples because I don't want to disparage 
pastors and preachers who have used these examples. Anyway, but to, but to <laughs> go back to your question, to go back to your question. Quick interruption, I just want to say and point out, we are actually going to talk about this example and this text and many more examples in the live stream coming up this week, Thursday, April 11th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So jump on with your questions and we'll talk about not only this example, but many more where we use historical context as a way of actually cloaking and hiding uh, and obscuring the meaning of the text rather than revealing it. Another example would be, for example, uh, when we talk about the yoke of Christ, Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary, take my yoke upon you. We usually refer to the yoke used on the oxen and then we stop there. But Jesus' whole point is that he's actually changing and transforming the image of the yoke. It doesn't have to do primarily with a historical artifact, but rather to a scriptural reference. If you think about it, what other uh, place in the Bible do we carry a yoke we see the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant. We see Christ carrying the cross. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, Jesus preaching at the on the boat from uh, across the waters from the boat to the people on the shore. It's not primarily because he's using the natural properties of the water to enhance or amplify his preaching voice, which is what we often hear. And then, you know, when we hear these historical um, explanations, we get a false sense of satisfaction about the meaning of the text. And we walk away rather than continuing to dig to the true meaning that's far beyond any of these kind of historical references to the scriptural references. Where does the scripture talk about uh, the, uh, the sea and the boat and uh, the shore and the people on the shore? And there's a lot more beauty and depth and richness uh, in that episode to explain what's actually happening. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about even perhaps the historical context that we use to change the meaning of the head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11. We use historical context or cultural context to try to change the meaning of even sexual ethics or, um, you know, women preaching or being in authority uh, from, you know, Timothy when we talk about the cult of Ephesus and Artemis and so on. And we use these things to try to change the meaning of the text rather than the, the actual scriptural references. So we'll get into all of that. Uh, bring your questions. Um, there's many more examples I have written down here. Or leave your questions in the comments on this video if you can't make it to the stream or if you're not sure. Whatever comes to mind, go ahead and leave a comment and I'll go ahead and answer it during the live stream. So leave it in this video. Now on top of all of that, we'll also get into the biblical symbolism of circumcision, Sabbath, the temple, everything from last week's episode, and everything from this episode right here about the mark of the beast, the biblical numerology of 666, and the book of Revelation, which we will get into right now. Anyway, but to, but to <laughs> go back to your question, to go back to your question, scripture interprets scripture. Yep. I think the best example I can give of that is, and the most relevant, is the book of Revelation. When we go to the book of Revelation, all of a sudden we throw everything out the window and we just impose our own modern ideas mm. into the text and we just make it say whatever we want it to say or we just contrive some sort of like points of reference uh, according to our like very narrow uh, window uh, of time in our lives um, and try to like use the newspaper to interpret scripture. It's the newspaper does not interpret scripture. The, 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 the news channels or the current events of, of, of geopolitics are not the primary um, interpreter of scripture. So we need, to, we need to be very slow to jump to those conclusions. Scripture interprets scripture, right? So I'll give you an example. This is a good example. So in the book of Revelation, um, we read about the mark of the beast, and people will speculate left and right for, for days and, and years about the mark of the beast. But before we speculate about what the mark of the beast could be in our modern time, we have to interpret it according to scripture. When scripture gives us uh, images or pictures or uh, references, what is the dictionary? Where is the dictionary that defines what these things mean? So I'm, 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 I would ask you that question. What, what is the dictionary? Where do we find the dictionary to define what all of these things mean? I usually just call you. No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but let's say you're reading Revelation or yeah. any book, any, any, any prophetic or apocalyptic book, um, and there's all these like images, all these things, like what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
what's the dictionary that helps us define what each of these things mean? All these images and all these... Um, the Bible. The Bible, exactly. The Bible is the dictionary for itself, exactly. Scripture interprets Scripture. So before we jump to like, oh, the, 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 the mark of the beast is a microchip. Oh, the mark of the beast is the vaccine. Oh, the mark of the beast is X, Y, Z. Before we jump to that, we have to first do, we can't take a shortcut. We have to do the work to go from A, B, C, all the way to Z. We can't jump from A to Z. We yeah. need to, yeah. So, so what, what's the work? I would ask you this question. Where do we see in the Bible a mark on the forehead? What's the first time we see in the Bible a mark on the forehead? This might take a minute, dude. Just tell me. It's okay. No, I think you'll get it. It's, it's in the very beginning. The very beginning? Yeah, yeah. Well, very close to it, yeah. Can't think of it. Okay, so we're talking about the mark of the beast, right? Okay, yeah. so the mark of the beast is obviously like something bad. Okay, what's the first bad thing that happens in the Bible, let's say? The first or the second. Like one of the first, you know, it's like... No, so maybe not the second, so the fall? Well, the fall is actually one of them, but uh -huh. it's less obvious, so we'll skip the fall. So what's the next thing after the fall? Uh, Cain kills Abel. Okay, and then what happens? I don't know. God marks him on the forehead with a mark. Oh, see, but I wouldn't have got that. Oh, okay, okay. So most people, most I don't even remember that. Okay, okay. Well, most people, most people will will will, will remember that you know mm -hmm. that that Cain was marked on the forehead. Okay, got it. Okay, so before Mark, before Cain was marked on the forehead, what did God say to him before he murdered his brother? Tell what? me. He said to him, "Sin is crouching at your door." Its desire is for you, but you must master it. So when God says to Cain, wow. he's warning him, he's saying sin is crouching at your door. Very poetic. Yeah, well, that's how God talks. But, but when, when God says to him, sin is crouching at your door, what, what image is God using there? What, what's the image there? Sin is crouching at your door. Crouching, what crouches? An animal. Yeah. A beast. Sure. Okay, so sin is like an animal or like a beast. Yeah. You could say like a tiger or a lion. or It doesn't have to be that, but, you know, we know that, obviously we know Satan is a, is a lion, you know, so we could put that in there. But the, the point is that sin is like an animal, like a beast, crouching at your door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Just like Adam and Eve were meant to master the animals, and, na and Adam named them, God is using that reality. He's saying you are to conquer and to name and to take dominion over sin, which is crouching at your door. It wants you. Okay, but did he, did, he, did he succeed in mastering or did he fail? He failed, right? Obviously, he murdered his brother. So he was overtaken by the beast, the sin crouching at the door. He was overtaken by the beast, killed his brother, and then God marks him on the forehead. That's the mark of the beast. So that mark was, was twofold. It was both a mercy and a judgment. Everything God does is both a mercy and a judgment, by the way. But God marks him as a, as a curse. It's a curse and, and, a, and a blessing. So it's a curse because it is uh, indicating to the whole world that this man is marked with a debt that he has to pay. And if anybody kills this man, they incur Cain's debt sevenfold. So the mark represents the debt that he owes of Abel's blood crying from the ground for payment, for justice, right? Um, so that's the mark of the beast. And so it, it judges him and it also protects him at the same time. So that's God's ju just justice and judgment and his mercy at the same time. Okay, now, so now you, you get the hang of it. So now let's go back to, there's actually a previous reference before Cain and you already said it with the fall to the beast and to a mark on the forehead so the, let's start with the beast where do we see the beast where do we see an image of a, uh, like a like an animal or beast before Cain with Adam and Eve let's say the snake serpent yes and then what but then they, they after they fall yes you're right no you're absolutely right but then once they sin what happens what does God do Once they sin, what does God do? What's the judgment? Um, painful childbirth. Yes, that's to the woman. And what's yeah. the judgment on the man? Uh, 
I don't remember. Tell me. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. Oh. Okay. Okay. By the sweat of your face or your nose or whatever. There's different Hebrew um, translations to that. But the point is, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. Mm -hmm. That's a mark of the curse is the sweat on the brow, on the forehead. And then they, he closed them in the skins of beasts. Hmm. He immediately closed them in the skins of beasts. So that's the mark on the forehead. And then they're clothed in the skins of beasts. The, the, the clothing in the skins of beasts, again, that's also a mercy and a judgment. It's a mercy because it covers their sh the shame of their nakedness, but it's also a judgment because it's manifesting the fact that they have now become bestial. They're covered in the skins of beasts because they have become like beasts. They descended from the divine image into the bestial image by sinning. And so, and so now they are uh, clothed in the skins of beasts as a, uh, as, a, as a picture and a manifestation of their nature, which has, which has now been corrupted. And, uh, and so they've lost their glory. Now their glory is no longer divine, it's bestial. Um, but it's also a mercy because it covers the shame of their nakedness. Okay, so that's both mercy and judgment. Everything God does is, is, is both mercy and judgment. Noah's flood is a judgment, obviously, but it's also a mercy because it cleanses and renews the whole earth and gives to the righteous a new world free from vi violence, right? So God, this is, you can read a lot of, about this in, in, a, in a book by Gentry and who's the other guy? Gentry and Willem. I think they wrote a book, a very, very good book. So I would, I would recommend that um, as well. But anyway, so uh, God's mercy and judgment are always two sides of the same coin. Um, so you have the mark of the beast with Adam and Eve, the, the sweat on the brow and the covered in the skin of beasts. You have the mark of the, of the beast with Cain uh, marked on the forehead and sin crouching at the door like a beast has overtaken him. You see this continue. And then we can skip ahead, let's say, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who... It, it, because he ex exalts himself, he becomes like a beast for seven years, right? And he um, he turns in, he he turns into an animal, but he, like a, he eats grass like an ox. His hair grows long, his fingernails, and he loses his his reason. So he becomes like a beast. And then the rest of the book of Daniel also uses the images the image of beasts, like the rams and the ghosts and goats in the visions, as images of pagan rulers, wicked, godless pagan emperors who conquer the world, take dominion, world empires. Okay, so, so over the course of the scriptures, we see a development of this image of the, the beast and the mark. Next question, why is the mark 666? Right? And people will jump to a million things to try to find what 666 means, but it's actually very simple. It says right there, it, already, it says it in the verse, it says, this is the number of man, or this is the number of a man. Why is six the number of man? Before we go to 666, let's just start with six. Why is six the number of man? Think about it. Was man made on the sixth day? Exactly. You nailed it. Man was made on the sixth day. What got else was... Well, what? I should say got him. What else, what else was made on the sixth day? Uh, don't ask me. I don't know. The beasts. Oh. And then they named the beasts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So man and beast were made on the sixth day. That's why it's the mark of man and the mark of the beast. That's why the number is six. Okay. Mm, interesting. Now, why is it 666? In, he, in the book of Hebrews, it says that mankind failed to enter God's rest, specifically Israel, but Israel as a, as a mm -hmm. representative of mankind failed to enter God's rest. So man failed to, to move from the sixth day to the seventh day. They, they never entered God's rest. Got it. They, st they stayed stuck on the, in the sixth day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mankind is stuck in day six. They're stuck there. They have not yet entered God's rest. Now, we who are in Christ enter God's rest because Christ was the true Adam, the true man, who finally broke past that, broke through that, and he brought us into the seventh day. So Christ, this is why, by the way, this is why uh, Sabbath has moved from uh, day seven to day eight or day one, from Saturday to, to Sunday. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But my point is that Christ puts to death and he embodies all of mankind. He embodies all of the old creation in himself. And then he is crucified and takes on the death that creation incurred. He puts it into the grave. 
he buries that old creation. He buries the, the, the sixth day, which is when he died, by the way. He died on Friday, the sixth day. The same day man was made is the day that man dies, the true man, Christ. So Christ finally fulfills the sixth day and says it is finished. It is finished referring to what? The old creation finally being completed and us finally entering this, the true Sabbath, like the Sabbath that we failed to enter. So we, we have now entered. We have, he has buried the old creation he's buried the old man he's buried adam into the grave and then he rises into a new adam a new humanity a new creation he himself being that thing he he is the new creation he is the new adam so he uh ushers in the conquest of death he ushers in a new creation he ushers in a new mankind which is uh mankind of the eighth day having passed through the seventh day which the eighth day is the eternal rest that this connects to circumcision being on the eighth day of of, of a israelite birth uh but we can come back to that later so there's a l little teaser there but anyway my point is to say that mankind has passed through the sixth day where he sinned into the seventh day which is god's rest now why is it important that man enter god's rest because on the seventh day when god rested what that literally means is that he sat enthroned so in the bible when god rests like when he rested, when the, when the presence of God, the Shekinah glory rested into the, in the temple, it's resting on the mercy seat in the ark in the Holy of Holies. What does that mean? It's sitting down. To rest means to sit down on a throne. So in the Bible, to rest means to sit down on a throne and to exercise dominion over the thing you have just completed. So that's what God does. He creates for six days. And then on the seventh day, that's the day he calls holy. The first time he calls it holy is because he enters into the creation he just made and makes it holy he himself is holy he sits enthroned on his creation and he rests and that rest god wants us to join his rest which isn't just to say like to join like in rest isn't inactivity rest is enthronement so we are to join god's rule his governance his his his, his enthronement over creation man failed to enter into god's rest man failed to mature and to join god and be seated with him and to reign with him right and christ fulfills that christ is the one who labors pays the debt not only the initial debt of man to be faithful and obey but also he pays the debt incurred by sin and the curse so he pays both debts by taking death and then he rises and is and then ascends and sits enthroned at the right hand of god so finally man has finally sat with God on his throne to reign with him. And that man is Christ. And so in Christ, mankind finally like fulfilled his purpose and entered into the seventh day and is enthroned with God, has entered God's rest, right? Okay. So that's why it's that's why entering the seventh day symbolizes a a completion of uh, and, and a maturation of mankind in Christ. So what does it mean, having, having said all that, what does it mean for the number that people are giving their allegiance to? What does that mean for that number to be 666? Six, six, six? We already said six means that man, man failed to enter the seventh. So what would you say, 666, six, six, why is it three times? Why is it there three times? If you had to guess. Don't know. Okay, well, God, okay, so we know God is holy, holy, holy. So that's, it's the testimony of two or three witnesses, right? So if there's, 666 six, six, that means we have established our own kingdom dominion on the sixth day and we refuse to join the god's kingdom on the seventh day that is man rebelling against god's throne against god's enthronement rebelling against his dominion they are rebelling against the seventh day which is god's kingdom so just like when adam and eve ate from the fruit and it was a rebellion. It was like, we want to be our own kings. We want to be our own authority. We want to be our own gods. We, if we were to make that rebellion perfect, it would be 666. And 666 is the establishing of man's kingdom with the refusal to enter seven. It's almost like, I, I don't want um, to add to scripture, but it's almost similar to the fraction two-thirds which is six forever it's point six 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 and it just never ends it's kind of like that where it just ne it's a never-ending day six that's kind of the idea yeah yeah 
you could say I'm not adding to scripture because the rest of Revelation talks about thirds a lot. Like uh, one third of, of mankind is, is uh, wiped out by, the, by one of the bulls. You know, one third of the ocean is, is destroyed by, by another bull of wrath. You know, so uh, there's a lot of thirds going on in the Revelation. So that, that mathematically isn't far off. But, so it's basically man being stuck in day six. So the, man, the number of man and the number of the beast is the establishing of the sinful kingdom of man in rebellion against the seventh day, against God's kingdom. Never ending six is because we refuse to rest. Yes, we refuse to, to submit to God's to um, dominion and kingdom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Once we, once we um, understand how the mark of the beast and what the mark of the beast means, then we can understand, okay, so the mark of the beast is actually like... It's a, it's, a, it's a big reality. It's, a big, it's, it's, it's talking about a big deal. Um, it's not just talking about like a, a, like a microchip in your hand or your forehead. It's, it's actually talking about like a, an entire uh, system of, uh, of Satan, which is to counterfeit God's kingdom uh, on the earth and to offer people a way of, uh, of prospering on the earth by making allegiances with the kingdoms of man. So that's, that has to do with, you know, not being able to buy or sell or trade without the mark, stuff like that. Like, we have to understand what, he's, what, it's, what it's saying at the, at the big level before we can understand what it, what it, how it might apply at the small level or at, in our current day. So to take it back, so that's an example. Now, to take it back to your question about scripture, interpret scripture, yep. the mark of the beast is a perfect example for people to, like, wake up and realize, oh, wow, like, this is actually really fruitful when you approach Scripture like that. When you approach Scripture and interpret it according to Scripture, and you interpret it uh, not according to the flesh or the reason of man or the wisdom of man, but according to the Spirit, which is what? The, the words of the Spirit are the Scripture. So only once we understand what six means biblically, not in my, our own minds, and what six and what the, the mark of the beast means, can we start to begin to then understand what that might mean in our current day but we have to we can't take shortcuts we have to understand it biblically first you know and so really the mark of the beast you see it in every generation and then suddenly everything clicks like if you look at history every generation had its own mark of the beast every generation had its own beast every generation had its own antichrist every generation had its own harlot every generation had its own babylon in the first century it was rome uh in the first century you also have king herod king herod acts like pharaoh Right, he slaughters all the infants two years and under, just like Pharaoh did, and Jesus escapes just like Moses did. Except instead of escaping from Egypt, he has to escape Judah in into Egypt. Um, and so now is it's like Israel has become the new Egypt that the new Moses has to escape from. Okay, so you see you see these these um, pictures are archetypal. They're archetypes. They're uh, images. They are. Um, symbols and they can be they can they can be applied to anything that ends up fulfilling that role this is why like when jesus calls the pharisees and john the baptist he calls them you brood of vipers and stuff like that like you basically he's saying he's, it's not just a like a catchy insult he's saying you're you're sons of the serpent he's saying that the seed line of seth which was the righteous seed and the seed line of cain which was the wicked seed of the serpent those two seed lines, you who you think you're part of the righteous line, actually you're part of the line of the serpent. Why? Physically, they were actually descendants of Isaac, of the true righteous seed, but they had begun to imitate their father, the devil. They began to imitate the devil and became his children because they imitated him. So anyone who imitates uh, Satan becomes a child of Satan. Anyone who imitates God becomes a, a, a child of God. So that's, that's how these... These things can apply. Um, anyone who starts acting like an antichrist is an antichrist. Anyone who starts acting like a beast is a beast. In the first century, you have, um, you know, you have Nero. You have Antiochus Epiphanes, who you know desecrates the temple. This is before, uh, beforehand. But you also have Jerusalem surrounded by armies. The, 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 the abomination of desolation. And, and the first century church went through a great tribulation and a great persecution. And the first century church escaped the, the judgment on the temple because they saw the signs that Jesus warned about and they fled to the mountains right before the temple was destroyed um, by, by Titus, before Jerusalem was sacked. 
in the first century, you have the harlot. Who's the harlot? Well, in the, the rest of the Bible, the harlot is Israel because the bride is supposed to be Israel. So the bride becomes the harlot. So in, the, in Revelation, the harlot is um, first century Israel. The synagogue of Satan, the false temple that was destroyed, uh, that were persecuting the, the temple of God, the Christians. You can see this also in um, Galatians 4. Paul says that. Uh, and then he says it also in Romans chapter 9 and 10 and 11. So, you know, you have all of these things fu being fulfilled in the first century as an example. And then that example applies in every generation. So, you know, there's some generations where it's more obvious than others. You could say, for example, like with the Reformation, you know, that's maybe an obvious example where um, the church had become corrupt and the bride had become like a harlot and there was an antichrist who uh, was set up in the temple of God as if he was a, a, you know, a vicar of Christ, but there was a lot of corruption and he was, they were acting uh, as an antichrist. Like John says, first John, you know, um, many, many antichrists have come. Antichrist is someone who's against Christ. So that's one example. You know, you have like, you could even say like Hitler. You could say that's an obvious example, let's say. Um, that's an easy, you know, example where, you know, he, he, you could say that he was a, a beast. Because the beast is what? We already saw beast is um, wicked, godless, pagan emperors that take dominion um, in a violent way, right? So, um, and exalt themselves and so on and so forth. So, you, you have to see it at a bigger level before you can apply it to what it may translate to in the modern time practically. Um, but anyway, the, my point is to say that's, that's an example of how what you said, Scripture interprets Scripture, is most obvious, where we need that. Because otherwise, we can make anything say anything we want. But we need the Bible to give us that meaning. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, if you're able to stick through this whole conversation. Obviously, Randall is a wealth of knowledge, and I think that he is finally starting to come out with that wealth of knowledge and sharing it to the rest of the world, um, which is something that me and his close group of friends has been encouraging him to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that I get a lot of that out of it every time he does that. Um, and I think that you guys will too, if you actually press in and listen to what he has to say and feel free to look at previous content if you haven't seen it before and subscribe for future content that he is going to post, um, especially if you're someone who wants to grow in their knowledge of God, the Bible, um, stuff like that. You're going to grow just by listening to the words that come out of this man's mouth. So thanks, man. Yeah, for sure. And uh, that's all we have for today. Um, we will. He will see you on the next video. So go on yeah. his channel. I also want to tell you guys to, to follow Nick because uh, he's he's not only is his channel awesome. He has guests on there that um, provide every color that makes up like the whole you know uh, spectrum. Um, that I can't provide my, by myself. And so his channel has a lot of excellent, um, you know, conversations and guests. I want to, I want to, um, thank you for being the one who actually got me to start mine. Uh, this man is, is the inspiration for finally, um, you know, giving birth to my own thing. And, uh, he's the one who really broke me out of that. Do you remember the first podcast when I was so anxious afterwards yeah, uh, because I, I had been holding all these things in for so many years and I, I, I felt weird about finally like speaking up about how I what I really think I he think helped we, me break out of that. Yeah, I think we only took one thing out of that whole conversation. I yeah. think you were trying to get to him like now we only need to do one. Yeah. And, and his his Nick was the one who really broke me out of that um, that, you know, out of that cave. And mm -hmm. finally, you know, uh, I, I could I could um, offer what I have to the, to the world, to you guys. So I, I just want you guys to uh, check out his channel. I'm actually on his channel on some of them, but yep. you know he has just top tier people. So go like and subscribe and comment on his stuff too. Um, I'll be on there probably in the future also, but um, and he'll be on mine at some point when I have his setup, which I don't have yet. But uh, anyway, thanks, Nick. Yeah, um, yeah, appreciate you.